if you want to give me your name, where you were born, and your date of birth. My name is Anita Christopher. I was born in Memphis, Tennessee on April the 14th, 1946. Okay, and then you, you're looking at me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so Memphis, uh, Tennessee, uh, and what are your parents? What, what's, what's their names? My mom was Katherine Johnson. My father was Bill Welch. And uh, they met in college. They met at Alabama A&M State University. Um, my mom was quite a bit younger than my dad, though. Uh, she uh, was quite a good student. And so she graduated high school when she was 16 and was in college at 16. And uh, they met there, but they dated and then went their separate ways. And it was quite a few years later that they reconnected um, and got married and had seven children. Uh, the first of us were born in Memphis. Me and my sister Doris were born at home at 1231 Manassas Street in Memphis, Tennessee. And um, my father was in a barber shop getting a haircut. And the police came in, they were looking for some black guy who had done something. And the people didn't give them the answers fast enough or accurately enough. So the police started just taking the billy clubs out and beating on some of the people in the barbershop. That day my father came home to my mom and said, we're moving. So we're going to uh, get out of this place because of the harsh treatment of the black people that were in Memphis at that time. So I was about nine months old when my mom, my sister, and myself moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan. We stayed originally with my Aunt Carol, who was already living here. And you hear a lot about the migration of um, African Americans coming up to the north, up to the north, <clears throat> north during the, during the, revol uh, 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 it was Industrial Revolution. My father was working on the C&O Railroad at the time, so he didn't come immediately. He was still working. And my mom and my sister and I, we stayed with my aunt, who was already here for a while, her and her family. Then my father came and we found a house to move into right a block away from, and, from my aunt. Okay. And so we were within walking distance to her in house Grand in Grand Rapids. What wrong word? Right on, uh, we lived at 851 Bemis Street. And uh, it's a parking lot there now. Uh, my aunt lived on Baxter, so they were very close proximity. And in future, other members of my family came here. So if we, if you can hold that thought for mm -hmm. a second. So did you tell me your, your, you told me your mother's name, but what about your, did you tell me your mother's name? My mother's name was originally Catherine Johnson. And your father's name you also told me. It was me. William Welch. Okay, William Welch. Uh -huh. I remember now yet. And so, uh, what about siblings? What were their names? I have uh, five sisters. Okay, Doris, uh, a year and a half older than myself. Then Ruth, we call her Ruth Ann. Then my mom had a set of twins, uh, Aubrey and Autry, uh, but they, we call them Pop and Bubba. And then my younger sister, Debbie, and Wanda is the baby of our family. We also have a stepbrother, when well, my father married years later, uh, named Michael Welch. And before my dad met my mother, he had a child named Herman Welch. And so it's, uh, we didn't live with Herman. Herman lived in Pensacola, Florida, still lives in Pensacola, Florida. And my brother Mike lives uh, out east in New Jersey. So do you remember, what do you remember about Memphis? Well, I, as a child, I was like, um, only a, a baby when we lived there. But I've been back to Memphis many times because we've had family reunions there. Um, let me get, I need a tissue. I'm just trying to leak over here. Hold on. Mm -hmm. okay, so, so I'm talking about my sisters and brothers. Um, um, we lived uh, at 851 Bemis and that's where my 
parents decided to move because the family was getting big for that little house on Bema Street. Then we moved to uh, 426 Thomas Street, right here in Grand Rapids. And um, we all were educated at Madison Park Elementary School and then on to South High School. So Madison Park Elementary uh -huh. was, what do you remember about that? Well, I remember that when I first moved into that neighborhood and being the only black child and one of my sisters or myself, we would be the only black kid in our what class. Was, what you? This was in 19, probably 52, 53, like in that time. And, uh, but I remember my parents being very active in the school. My father being the father vice president of the PTA. And I remember because the, every year the PTA would put on a school carnival. And my dad would be in charge of getting the prizes for all the games and things. So, you know, being a kid, that's the, that held my interest, all the different pri prizes that could be won at the school carnival. But, um, even before that, I remember my folks always being really involved in the school is very important. Uh, I, when I was at my kindergarten school, we lived on Bema Street. I went to Henry School, elementary school. And at Henry Elementary School, in the kindergarten, I can remember my father bringing his truck. He worked for National Cash Register, and we did community helpers. And my dad brought his truck to the school so all the kids could go in it and climb around in there and see just what my dad did, you know. Uh, uh, that was something that uh, I guess every, every parent is com in the community could show some of the things that, that they do. And I think back on that and thinking that was kind of a, a, a for us being kind of a um, minority, a real <laughs> minority, my dad and him just took off and did things like, uh, became an in integral part. One of my earliest memories at Henry School was carrying my cat to school in a box. I had a kitten, we did pets, I was in the kindergarten, so we are doing pets. And so I carried my cat, Fluffy, to kindergarten with me. And I remember she was so good, she stayed in the box and I'm walking, I walked to school, so. Uh, get to school and my teacher, uh, she, we were learning to write and there was a big, a big uh, lettered paper on, the, on a chart and she wrote a poem and it said, Fluffy, Fluffy, black and white Fluffy, here Fluffy, meow. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember that all these years because I was so proud to um, have my cat in the, in the spotlight, I guess. But at uh, um, Madison Park, we was, you know, we were just always taught to. Madison Park was the high school. Madison Park was the next elementary the school. Next elementary. I was kindergarten and first at Henry, and we moved to a bigger house. We moved to a house that had five bedrooms in, in it. The same area. In the same area, but in a different school district. Still was in the inner city, mm -hmm. but um, uh, but it was in more like Heritage Hill area. Okay. And um, uh, so we had a, a, a big house because my family was big. Um, we ended up with uh, seven, seven siblings in that house, my mom and dad. But the most, uh, I think the, the biggest challenge of my childhood was my mother uh, got cancer. She had colon cancer. And she was a teacher. She was teaching here in the Grand Rapids Public Schools. And she had just gone back to teaching uh, because she had kids and she stayed at home and everybody's mom stayed at home. And she got uh, the last day of school, she went to the doctor. And I remember her coming home and saying, they want me to go to the hospital right now, you know. And uh, we helping her get her little bag together to take to the hospital and she never came home again. She passed away that summer. She taught to the last day of school. She was teaching at that time at Henry School, the school that I had been in kindergarten in. And she uh, had cancer all that time, but she just thought she was tired. And um, 
when she she was taking Geritol. That was a, a for iron floor blood. Everybody's advertising Geritol, so she took Geritol. And back then, people didn't go to the didn't run to the doctor with everything. You went when you had a baby, but then only when the baby was delivered. You didn't go, you know, this every month and every six weeks like they do now. But um, so she really had no idea what was wrong with herself. And then with having seven kids, well, you just didn't spend money if you didn't feel like, oh, it's, I just take this Geritol and I'll feel better. Well, she was seriously ill and still working every day. And so what was she like? What was she? Uh, my mom, she was, uh, uh, she was the disciplinarian of the family, but she always stressed um, high morals. She, she lectured us as girls, having a family of girls, on uh, being a lady, you know. Um, she uh, had high expectations for all of us. We all knew that we would go to college. It was no question about that, and it wasn't a, even a big discussion. It was just an assumption. I remember one, uh, a story that my sister, one of the twins, tells about the last day of school when she was in um, Oh, she must have been in about the second grade, Pop, my sister Aubrey. And she came home, and Mom was on the last day of school, Mom was on the porch, and she had a report card. And she said, I passed, I passed. And she ran down the street hollering, to, telling her mom, telling Mom, I passed. And my mom said, come here. Don't ever run like you've done some great big thing because you passed. You were expected to do that. And so she said, now if you had all A's, maybe then you can fan your, your report card in the air and talk about that. But she says, the expectation is that you will pass, you know. <laughs> so that was kind of my mom in a, in, a, in a story form there. She expected us to do well. And I remember whenever we would bring report cards home, she would tell us, the first thing I'm looking at is your deportment. She says, you might not be the smartest child in that class, but I know you know how to behave. So she looked down, she expected you to have the top marks in your citizenship and your behavior. She said, that's what's most important. Then I'm going to look at your grades, you know. So yeah, she held, she held a high standard for us uh, as we came up, all of my sisters and, and uh, my brother. Um, just knew that that was her so way. So she, she taught you about behavior and deportment? And yes. The, uh, so her background as a teacher, I guess she's middle, yeah. you would say middle income? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Middle yeah, class. yeah. And my father, um, uh, he, he always had, 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 he had a great yeah, job too? yeah, he all, he always worked two jobs. He didn't have... Um, was that area, was that a middle class? For black people. For black people, that's right, what I'm right. Yeah, it what was does a, that mean? What does that mean? It means that um, it, it's a ceiling there. It's a ceiling there. It's only uh, so you're only going to go so high. But we were in the higher portion for that uh, for the for where we were allowed to go. A story about that would be my father worked at the National Cash Register Company for years and years and years, uh, probably twenty some years. And uh, he, his boss's name was Mr. Cook. On the weekends, uh, my father was like the janitor. He would go and clean. That was extra income. So we would go to the, uh, with him and help empty trash and all of that. Um, but during the week, he delivered the cash registers to the different stores, and he uh, repaired cash registers. Well, Mr. Cook had been his boss as long as I could remember and then Mr. Cook passed away and they got a new they got a new a boss and this new boss was going through the files of all the employees and he called my dad in and he said Bill I was just looking at all the employee files and he said you know you're the only person here with a college education but he was the low man on the totem pole mm -hmm. so this he new never moved up. They, my father used to say they bring 18-year-old guys from right out of high school and they go to salespersons and different office jobs there. And that's kind of was the expectation even back then that 
you had a place and that was your place. And the uh, black middle class community lived with the rest of the people, the rest of yeah, the people. Yes, all, we, all go to, we all went to church together, all went to the same churches and uh, 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 same schools, um, basically. Um, back there was no, no dividing line. No, back in, in, in those days, we were like it was a, there were boundaries around a certain, and they did a lot of redlining where when we moved from Bema Street to Thomas Street, every house around us were white families. And we played with those kids. It was no, they didn't call us nigger or anything like that. We played. They come over to the house, and, uh, but that was a short lived period. We rode bicycles. I can remember riding on the back of the bike when the white kids riding or they rode on the back of my bike. But I noticed that um, people were moving. Um, kids, were, I remember asking my mom, could I buy the goldfish of a kid down the street? Their family was moving away. What year was this? Again, it was in the mid-50s. Mid so people are moving. People are moving away. The, the, uh, uh -huh. the white, white people the, are moving. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, and then uh, a black family would buy the house. And I did not realize that we started that move, that, that big move of all the different white families. And mm -hmm. we were in a corner house. What do you mean we started? My family, being a black family, moved into that neighborhood that was all white. The realtors sold us that house. Then they go to the white family's houses and tell them, you know, there's a black family moving in down the street. Would you like to sell your house? And most time, because of the thing called white flight, they wanted to move because they thought the black families are going to take over this neighborhood. Well, what happens is they sell the those houses to black families, so then you have a whole family that's that's, I mean, whole neighborhood that's, that becomes black. And I observed that, not really knowing what was happening as a child. I observed the, the neighborhood change, and I just had more, more black friends now, more black kids moved in, and then at school, when I got to the fifth and sixth grade, now there were a lot of black kids to play with, and I wasn't the only black child in a classroom. But I mean, I've had, had opportunities to experience um, things in my life that had an impact, and uh, uh, particularly around race relations. Um, when I was a kid, we went to visit my grandparents who lived in Alabama, and uh, we, dealt, we dealt with things very differently when you got down south. I can remember my father, who was a uh, former athlete. My father was a football player. He played in the uh, baseball in the Negro Leagues. Your, yeah, your yeah, my dad did, okay. and uh, he was and quite. Had a team here? No, down down in Alabama. In he Alabama. was in Alabama, okay. and uh, he went to college on a football scholarship. That's oh. how he got to Alabama and and where he met my mother, but. Um, I remember when we would go down south, my father was a very big guy, but when he, when we went down south, he was served in ma'am to everyone. You noticed that? Yeah. It was, he had a different demeanor. And he told us we would have a different way of doing it. Because when pe this, people would have a real strong southern drawl, and we would go to the gas station, and they would, uh, talk to them. Well, you go right down here or something like that. We would snicker and laugh. And my father really got after us. He said, you don't do that. You can get us in a lot of trouble by doing that. <laughs> so so we had to make sure we didn't do that. But I mean, I, we would go to the gas station and my father would say, do you have a bathroom that my kids can use? And they say, no, and just keep on filling your gas. Or you would see a sign that said, um, white men, white ladies, and then there'd be a sign of a finger pointing into the woods behind the gas station and just say colored. So I mean, if you got to go to the bathroom, you go out in the woods behind the gas station. We saw that. 
I've been at the uh, at Grandmama's house, and we go to the show. I remember the Beatles movie was playing, A Hard Day's Night. So we're in the, that's in the '60s even, and we went to the Pick Theater in Evergreen, Alabama. And you have to pay your money in the front, and then you walk down a little alley, and then up the steps to the balcony. That's where the colored people had to sit. And so we're up there in the balcony on a Wednesday night watching the Beatles movie, and all of a sudden, halfway through, the picture goes away. And so I thought, well, they the film must have broke, you know. Then the projectionist comes out and says, y'all go on home now. And we're like, well, the movie it was not over. He said, go on home, ain't nobody here. And downstairs, nobody white had bought a ticket. So <laughs> they weren't going to show it, and so we just had to leave. Uh, even though we had paid our money, we saw half of the movie. So um, I, I have experienced uh, that kind of uh, racism in the South. But I did not realize when we moved into that neighborhood on Thomas Street that all the nice white kids I had been playing with, their parents was moving them away. And that maybe my family moving in was the cause for all of these different people moving. So how were you feeling about those experiences? I did and not, I, I didn't, accepted yeah, I, I, I didn't, it, because uh, as a kid, I think as, it did not impress me like it did later on in life when I knew what was going on, the ramifications of that thing. I, as a kid, just thought, oh well, you know, that's just the, the way they want to do that, so I didn't get, you know, I didn't really get into it. But as I got older, I became more involved in NAACP. I was a, in the NAACP Youth Council and I became involved in uh, uh, any initiative, our church, a, a support for marches that were, uh, for activities or things that uh, Ron was. NAACP Youth Council, what did you do? What did you do there? Oh, I attended the meetings uh, that they had at our church. They had a, at meetings at our church. And then um, a lot of things that were happening in the South we supported them either by uh, speaking out against them or uh, support uh, through marches up here. As students. Or, yeah, as, as students, as um, young people, um, holding conventions where the um, um, policies was made as how you would address situations down there and then supporting it by finance, you know, our dues and financial uh, support for the people that was on the front lines. Freedom Riders and um, uh, folks that were trying to integrate schools. My parents talked a lot about that, and I started learning through through my my parents what was going on. So your parents, they had also done that in their school when they were in school. They were active. Activists. They 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 were not active until the the. Um, I guess the, the biggest de defiance was just moving away from the down south. That was up to that point. The barbershop is Yes. The moving from there and that, it's just saying we're just not going to be treated this way. And they moved away. But my folks, when they came to M Michigan, um, most times they were more educated than most of the people that they were in, in, you know, seeing at school or on the PTA and things like that. And, um, I, and my mother uh, was a housewife at the time. She didn't, the um, only things that she participated with were more with the PTA or going to school to see for conferences and that kind of stuff. Um, they did not demonstrate at that time. Uh, so she participated in like family picnics? Uh, yes, yes, we did. A, did we, we, did, we, we had a tight knit family because I had a lot of, my mom's, two of her sisters lived here. My Aunt Vera and my Aunt Carol. Aunt Carol had five kids, so they were all my first cousins. My Aunt Vera had one, so uh, they, that was my cousin. And um, then my father's brother moved here, and he ended up having, uh, Uncle General, he ended up having nine kids. So we all lived in the same, seven of us, nine of them, 
all of us on this within two two or three houses of each other in the same block even the same block and to this day many people don't know who is my brother or who, who you know how we're related they'll think that uh, my cousin is my brother they'll ask me how's your brother and I, they're talking about a cousin because we live so close the together a right a right <laughs> exactly so no, a lot of people still confuse who's 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 actually my brother or my sister in oh, that's like migrants so uh -huh, right with the whole family yes yes Everybody exactly like, like that in the same block so. and and uh, we did a lot of activities together christmas and we do today we still do it had that that did not change about our family uh, and the way we 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 get together but um a lot of the traveling down to my grandmother's in alabama uh, they, my my cousins, we'd all go. You know, it'd be a caravan going down, down to Evergreen. We just all of us did it again. Just past year, my my one surviving aunt turned 100 years of old. My aunt Sarah, my father's sister, mm -hmm. she turned 100 in May, and they had a big party, a big celebration for her. And my cousins from everywhere came: Australia, California. New Jersey, everywhere, they came for her party. And so we got to see cousins that we may not have seen. Some of my cousins' father was in the Air Force and they lived in Alaska. So we hadn't seen them in a long time. We didn't see them as much. Everybody that, every, every one of her siblings' children were there. Big, big deal for a little town that has about 15,000 people in it. Evergreen, Alabama. They had billboards. The mayor was there. You know, it's a uh, it's a tiny little town. So there's a, a few more. Uh, so she she is your father's brother, My, sister. Uh huh. Yeah. And does, does he have any other sisters and brothers? He has there? one brother. Uh, the living? baby the baby boy James. He lives in La Pac, California. I believe. Can you get people in Australia and everything? Yes, out? yes. How yeah. they get there in the from, Well, from my the cousin, service? my cousin that's uh, in a, from Austra uh, Australia, he is a drummer, and he plays with bands. And he was on a, a cruise ship playing with the band, and they went to Australia, and he decided to stay there for a while and play at a club there, and then he got married, and then he had children. And he's just lived there forever. And that was one of the, my, my brothers that, see all of us were the same last name, Welch. And uh, my, he lived, they lived right down the street from us. So a lot of people say, oh, your brother that lives in Australia. I said, well, actually it's my cousin, you know, but, mm -hmm. <laughs> but because my name was Welch and his name was Welch, they got us all mixed up in together. But uh, uh, he came, his daughter came, and she was li actually, in living in Greece at the time, she's a, she's an artist and she's in living in Greece. Uh, I think of, of of my family as a family of achievers. Um, we have uh, what my cousin's daughter uh, that lives in Chicago. She's a physician, and uh, she, she was there. Um, we just have a, a family of people who who because of our grandparents and their desires to really make a difference and, and have educated children both sides, which is really kind of unusual. All of my aunts and uncles on my father's side went to college. All of my aunts and uncles on my mother's side went to college. And my mother's aunts, which is a, another generation before them, went to college. I actually have a, aunt, a great aunt who we have letters from Eleanor Roosevelt to her. Um, we have letters. They knew the Alex Haley family. We have mm -hmm. letters from Alex Roots. Haley's from Roots. We have Alex Haley's father writing my aunt Sweet, and in there he's talking about Alex being in the Navy and telling what his kids are doing. Mary McLeod Bethune is another person that. So you uh, have these letters. Though. Yeah, we have these letters, and then we have one letter from Booker T. Washington. One, my aunt Vivian taught at his school, and he was asking her if she's going to come back for the next year to teach at the school in this letter. Uh, but from what I understand, she decided not to go back and teach there. Uh, I guess the salary was pretty low. 
and so she did not go back and teach at the Tuskegee Institute that uh, so um, where Booker the, T. Washington. So where are these letters? Who, well, my, the <clears throat> I have a cousin who's a historian and a nationally known historian. His name is Sterling Stuckey. And Sterling uh, kind of is the gatekeeper of all of this. And at Howard University, in the library at Howard University, the original copies of all these letters are kept. They're archived, uh -huh. They're archived there at Howard University in Washington, D.C. And then at one of our family reunions, they had copies made of all the letters and oldest child in each family unit received. So I have, I have copies of, of all of them uh, that I keep at my house, you know, that I show my kids, you know, for them to show their children some of the um, important documents. So your grandparents, they, they play a major role in this. Yes. Yeah. What, what is their name? Well, um, even before them, great-grandparents, I have a great-great-grandfather. Well, I'll go all the way back as far as I know. Okay. Um, my aunt, my great-great-great-grandmother my was Catherine Olivia Alley. She was a slave owned by a, a white owner named Henry Alley. And uh, when she was 18, she was freed. She, she, what was this? Uh, it's in this. It's around in the same area of Memphis, hmm. in in Tennessee, and um, not Mississippi, Tennessee, and Georgia, and in, uh, in that area. But um, uh, she was freed when she was 18 years old. The thing about her that is outstanding is the fact that she was taught to read by the family of her father. She actually, her, her mother died in, in childbirth, the slave Penny, I mean Edna, and she died in childbirth. And the father took her into the house, the white house, I mean the big house, and they raised her. And the wife of the slave owner taught her to read. And she's just a little half-read child. And they're doing something that's against the law to teach her to read, but they did it anyway. That planted the seed of education, importance of education in that our family. When she was freed, she was one of very, very few African Americans who could read and write. And so she was utilized to um, for do notes for the different groups and organizations that were African American or African because a lot of the, some of the new churches, she did a lot of that writing for them and keeping records for them. And um, when she, she married my great-great-grandfather, um, then my great-great-grandfather learned to read from her. Now in Memphis, Tennessee right today, there's a high school called Manassa High School. And I mentioned that I was born at 1231 Manassa, right across the street from where I was born is a huge high school called Manasseh High School. That land was owned by my great-great-grandfather and he built the first Manasseh school across. All my mom and all her sisters, they went to that school. But you that's your grandfather. my great-great-great-great-great-great-removed great, 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 grandfather founded that school okay. across the street. And when we go to the family reunions now, when we go there, I mean, it's a great big, huge campus school now, you know. They just have upgraded it and re remodeled it. And uh, when he built it, it was a little house, a little schoolhouse. And then it became two schoolhouses. But that's the school my mother went to. And that's the school my aunts and uncles all went to. But uh, it started out with my great-great-grandfather building Manassas School there. And they have a historical plaque in front, the government historical plaque in front of Manassas High School proclaiming my grandfather's involvement in uh, founding that, that school. So yeah, they had a big, big thing. Your family is part of, of uh, Arkansas history. Yeah, um, um, Memphis, Tennessee, yeah, Memphis, 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 oh yes, yes, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Tennessee, yes. The, my mother's 
brothers in Memphis, in Memphis, Memphis Tennessee. But this other town was, you said Evergreen. Evergreen, that's my father's side of the family. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. So in Memphis is uh, the Johnson family. And um, when we go for family reunions there, we usually go by the school, have some function at the school, uh, uh, just to show our young people that this is something that's in your family history. Um, my my mother's um, uh, the whole that whole family and their aunts they, they they had that same thing like my mom very high expectations you're expected to do well in school yeah they they don't tolerate foolishness around around the school so most of my cousins are educators. Even my aunt who was on my father's side who was a hundred years old, she has taught math for 40 years. But it's just, 40 years. yeah, 40 years in, in Alabama. But now on this side, my, my cousins were teachers, uh, principals. It's just a, a ongoing. And then we and my family and my, my sisters and brothers, the same way. Um, my sister Doris who's a year older than me, born in Memphis. She taught um, math, I mean, she taught English at Creston High School here in Grand Rapids for 39 years, mm -hmm. head of the English department. And Ruth, my sister that's under me, she was a, a principal at Henry School and it became quite acclaimed for, uh, uh, in you, you, Marva Collins, you know the Marva Collins in Chicago. Right, right. My sister Ruth is the Grand Rapids equivalent of Marva oh, Collins. Okay. So you get... Uh, so she kind of started her own school. Yeah, too. well she didn't start her own school. She went into a school that was closing. And they she, were closing the school down and she built the school she back, up back up to be in a nationally recognized school. So so uh, she, she's retired and now. what's her name again? Ruth Jones. Ruth, Ruth Jones. Ruth Jones. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and she now is a consultant to a lot of the schools in the area when they're trying to deal with certain issues or whatever they get her covered. She comes, she says she, she does a lot better as far as finances being a consultant than she ever was as when she was a principal. Mm -hmm. But uh, this all comes from that one little slave girl who was educated back in those days that they put that seed of the importance of... Uh, the slave girl was what her name? That was Carolyn K. Al Olivia Ali. Okay. Allie, oh, A-L-L-E-Y, yeah, yeah. Allie. Mm -hmm. And um, so we have her to thank for a lot of, a lot of that. From her, her daughter? From her, she had um, a, my great-great-grandfather. Okay. Uh -huh, mm -hmm. Who is, you know, and that's my, fa my mother's father. Okay. And um, that has served our family well. That has and served them. He was not an educator. He was a contractor. He built buildings, and that's when the, mm -hmm. you know, he he learned that skill from his father, who built the school across the street, mm -hmm. you know. But all his sisters, they were educated, and um, the one of his sisters was the one that had taught with Booker T, and one of the sister uh, that was the sister also that had. Uh, um, um, Eleanor Roosevelt, she worked on committees with uh, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and um, McLeod Bethune. Uh, she did a lot of those kinds of things. And I've only, I only saw her maybe three times in my life at a, a, at a reunion. And one of the, over the years, she accumulated great, a uh, lot of wealth. One of those sisters also, if you ever heard of Lane College in Jackson, Tennessee, one of them married into that family. Um, they're quite historical in that in in um, that that time period that they lived. Um, it's archived. In, yes, at Howard, in, University. In Howard University in in, in, in Washington D.C. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, some of I mean there were some great people. Uh, du Bois, uh, my cousin Sterling, tells the story of E.B. Um, du Bois. Uh, wanting to know him as a, he, he's a historian, and he went to visit my Aunt Vivian in Baltimore, Maryland, where she lived. And she said, he was studying Du Bois. She said, would you like to meet him? And he's like, wow, yeah. <laughs> she get on the phone and called him up, and he had, came over, and they, he got to meet one of his idols. 
but she she knew those she knew those people you know and there's a high school in Baltimore Maryland there's a whole wing named after her I have a cousin <laughs> I have another is cousin that, is your cousin yeah that's my that was my and great in aunt Baltimore. in Baltimore. Baltimore that's a great aunt, aunt. uh huh that knew Du Bois and some of the great minds of that time Langston Hughes and and, and those those people and you knew about these people. I knew about the people, but never knew them. You know, I just knew my aunt. I only. But I mean, you knew them through history. You yeah, studied. right, right. Had studied them, and so yeah. had so had yeah. Sterling. Sterling um, uh, is a um, really a, a, a somewhat of a genius. Um, Sterling is. Sterling Stuckey. He's one of my cousins. Mm -hmm. His 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 uh, mother is my aunt Elma, and uh, he's lives in California now, but he was from Chicago. He taught at Northwestern. He was a professor there for many, many years at Northwestern. And uh, then he moved uh, to California to uh, take on a, a job at another college out there. But he's a, a historian. He knows a lot of the, a lot of the uh, people that are in the higher echelons of education right now. We went to, um, He's kind of fanatical <laughs> about it. We went uh, uh, to a family reunion that was held in Cincinnati, and they have an African American History Museum there. So we went to the museum, all the family, you know, as one of the activities of the reunion. And this young lady was our guide, telling us some, but she told the f facts differently from what S Sterling knew to be. He just took it so personal that she didn't tell it right and it ended up being a big we was like just forget it it's okay you know but he really was riled up about this thing because she's the guide and she's telling the history wrong according to what he felt it was uh in the in the, the long story short he's ended up getting involved with the the people that run the museum or uh and they were and it was corrected the the spiel that she gives had to be uh, corrected. Um, but yeah, the, I, I think all of this goes back to that um, this slave girl. And then sometimes I look at how my parents both would meet in, and both of them have similar background as far as education is, is concerned. The, what is the background? What did they study? Well, um, my, both of them were in education. Oh, both of them did. Both of them were in education. And I think, too, at the time, we're talking this probably 30s. There were not that many. 1930s. Yeah, when my parents met, that must have been. Well, there were not a whole lot of different careers for African Americans. You could be a teacher, and you could be a, a nurse. There weren't really a lot of options, and so almost of my family, that's what they were into: education. They, they, for, for, for their careers. A lot of my cousins uh, went into that. Now, as the younger generations, we're seeing different things. We're seeing more lawyers, we're seeing uh, engineers. Um, my, my, my daughter is an uh, agricultural environmental engineer. She has her PhD in engineering. Um, my cousin Janice's daughter, like I was saying, she's a, a, a physician. They're, they're going into different different areas. But back when I was going to school, okay, you can be a nurse or a teacher. I thought that's viable. If you got, um, you could go and uh, uh, go to your counselor at high school. And when my sisters and I went to South High School, usually if the counselor called you down to talk about your future plans, they would steer you toward a factory job or tell you something you can do with your hands. My sister, who it became the head of the English department at uh, Creston for 39 years, she was told that it would be best for her to, she had real good small muscle control on the, on the test and showed hand dexterity, that she should go to a factory where they made keys or did small parts or something like that. They didn't encourage her to go to college. And so she, of course, with my parents and my, the, my, our background, it was, you know, okay, we didn't pay that any attention with the council. In my case, they didn't even call me down to talk about future plans. 
but I've talked to so many and heard so many different people that went to my high school that when they did get that call to go down and talk about your future, they were discouraged from going to college. They said, you just get your heart broken because college is not something for you. You know, get you a good job in a factory somewhere and, um, you know, then you make a nice living and take support your family that way. But um, unfortunately, the people that I've talked to um, and the pe people that I heard, Dr. Lawrence Red, he was very, he came here to the United Methodist Community House as a kid. And he went to, he became a dean at Michigan State University. But he was in the, the education field. He was in the education okay. field. But the thing that he had been told was that he needed to be a he was a special ed student, and that they wanted to put him in special ed. He came here after school classes, and the the, the uh, staff here encouraged him to just work hard. You don't need to. You're not special ed. You're not a special ed student. You're a good student, and just keep your grades high and all that. And when I went to South High School, he's a bit older than me, I remember being so proud because he was the student council president, this person that was supposed to be in special ed. But he was student council president, and of course, for me, that was like, oh wow, I look at him doing assemblies at school at a high, when I was in high school, and I thought, well, oh, this is just fantastic, this young uh, black guy has got so much going on for him. And he kept on going, like I said, and ended up being a a dean at Michigan State. And then when we had youth groups and so forth here at United Methodist, all he'd do is just call him and he said, bring the group down, he'd show them around, treat them to a ball game, you know. Uh, uh, and then he'd come back when we had our 100th anniversary here at United Methodist Community House. When we had that 100th anniversary, he was our keynote speaker. And he told the story about how he was going to be in special ed, but he was encouraged by the people who worked here and told him, you're, you're not special ed, you, you're a good student and you just work hard and you can go where you want to in life. And he did. He did just that. And United Methodist Community House did a lot of work uh, in the 50s and 60s with, with the youth. Yes, yes, uh, they were, they... Why, why were, did the youth need a lot of work? Well, in the... Back in the day, and I was one of those students, you know, there were not a lot of opportunities for um, uh, clubs and things like that, things to give you, you know, we didn't, we had a TV set and at you, home. You're at, the, at the present time, you're the, the director of the... Uh, at this time, I am the director of the senior program here at United Methodist Community House. But I've held so many other, I came here as a director, as a teacher's aid in the classrooms, in the child care. What year was that? Uh -huh. That was in 1967, okay. probably about six, maybe 66. I came here to, to, because I was at Western Michigan University as a student, and it was the summer and I needed a summer job. And someone said they were hiring aides in, for the classrooms here. So I came and I did that for that year and just kind of really felt in love with working with early childhood education, the, the little ones, even preschoolers. And so I kind of changed my focus from elementary ed, which I was already working with small kids in, in my field, but I really focused on the early childhood education from that point, taking more classes in that and then getting into some management classes because I wanted to be a director of a child care. And um, that's kind of what I, I did. But um, from that being an aide to having my own classroom, and then from having my own classroom to being the director of the child care, and then from being the director of the child care to being over the program director, so I was over the little bit of the senior program, the teen program, youth program, and child care. And then I went from, from that to being interim executive director over the whole building and uh, when they found their, I was like that for a year and a half, they found that, uh, uh, someone who would take over for that, uh, senior, I mean over the CEO position, then I was director 
of uh, operations. I did that for a while. I've done almost every job in uh, fund development. Um, I've done that. So I've done a little bit of everything. And then I um, was gone for a while because I contracted breast cancer. So I thought I was retiring. Actually, I retired from here twice. <laughs> and I come back twice. But I, when I retired, I came back as director of the senior program. And uh, I think it's a good fit because that, that's at my time in life when I'm into the same things that seniors are into, you know. And I don't have the patience I had when I came here back in the day to be in the child development area anymore. Um, but yeah, the United Methodist Community House uh, had a huge child uh, 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 youth program at one time. On any given day, we'd have 150. 200 youth here. It was our um, most in, uh, uh, ambitious uh, and area. Teen teenagers. These were these were uh, kids coming after school program, as well as kids that came here for programs. And there was a gentleman on our staff named uh, Clarence Smith. We called him Rock. I had known him from years and years ago too, and. They had a program called the Pink Panther Lawn Service. They had a uh, youth programming that was... Um, Who was that, the Pink Panther Lawn? The Pink Panther Lawn Service, they, the kids had a business. They, ran a, they had their own business, and that's what it was uh, promoting entrepreneurship. Uh, they handled their banking, they handled their uh, customer relations. You know, they taught them how to, to, to do the the job from the beginning to the end. They go out and estimate the yard, how long, how many people it would take to cut that yard and how much it would cost. And then they had their meetings and, and carried that. And then at the end of the, no one got a paycheck. The money was banked. And then at the end of the year, they would plan a big trip. And these kids went to Disney World two or three times. They went to the uh, Jersey Shore. They traveled all up to Canada they would plan their trip and it would come out of the money that they had earned. And then any monies that was left over was divided up amongst the crew and was used for school clothes or uh, school books or what have you. So that went along beautifully for many, many years. And, and this was through the banks and through the... Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, 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 the women's too, I believe. The, 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 this was a, women it was a program of the United Methodist Community House and all the programs, United Methodist Community House, the building is owned by the United Methodist Women. And then they also, the United Methodist Women. Okay. this building That's is right their, here. this is their building. Um, but uh, we also get financial support from the United Meth, we are a mission of the United Methodist Church, and the global yes, and the yeah, the um, Board of Global Ministries uh, supports us as well. So there's a lot of di then you have the local churches that support the um, but one some the newest thing that has happened, we <clears throat> have always been supported by the West Michigan Conference of the United Methodist Church. That's one funding source. Um, the, we, the United Methodist Community House is the only mission of the United Methodist Church in the state of Michigan. They have the Detroit Conference, which covers the rest of the map in the Upper Peninsula, that we're not part of the group that supports us, which is West Michigan Conference. In the Eastern. So yes, so that's the East Conference, they just call it Detroit Conference, but it goes all the way, everything that's not West Michigan and the Upper Peninsula. They just had a big conference not too long ago and it was a vote, and those two conferences are joining together now. So it's a great opportunity for United Methodist Community House to receive the support from that whole area of the state that they had not been supported by up until this point. Uh, so it's, it, it, the future looks real bright as far as the opportunity for fund development uh, and uh, hopefully that's going to be the answer to a lot of our financial issues in um, uh, operating the because uh, our, our budget here is probably uh, two and a half million dollars is what uh, we have to bring in 
and the money comes in from a lot of different sources. United, a lot of people see United Methodist in front of our name and think that this place is supported solely by the United Methodist Church, and they probably have a lot smaller uh, percentage, maybe 10 percent of the support that that comes here to take care of the program. Because so you're more ec ecumenical. Well, or you uh, seek outside support. We seek outside support. We have support from United Way. We have support from Area Agency on Aging and the Older American Act Senior Millage for Senior Program. The, uh, the a lot of foundations support um, the Kellogg Foundation, DeVos Foundation. They do a lot with the child care right now. Um, uh, 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 the senior program, a lot of their support had come from the Tomi Foundation, but I think we did a three-year uh, um, uh, support from them that has ended uh, with 2014. So um, we are always looking for new uh, fun, uh, foundations and things to, uh, to support the programs that we Because for a while I believe that the United Methodist did not want to, want to be ecumenical or did not want to also well, support well, or, or they, I, they have, I experienced that in the past. Mm -hmm. they, yeah, they have never, never uh, said that we we didn't never we've never done doctrine here. We've never okay. we've never been the one say you have to because I don't think there's a so single person since I've been working here who is not United Methodist. Since I've been working here, everybody uh, is has various uh, religions, and that has not been frowned upon. You know, you can be whatever background uh, uh, you want, um, but you have to adhere to the mission of the United Methodist Community House, which is increasing the ability of children, youth, adults, and seniors to succeed in a diverse community. So, long as you do that, we they don't care if you're Baptist or Church of God in Christ or. AME or whatever it may be and I know some of the people in the church when they uh, do tours or whatever they ask about that they ask if if this is a place where you teach um, doctrine or, and and it's no we receive government monies and of course you gotta keep that kind of separate from the church monies and uh, they don't so if you want to receive government grants then you can't teach doctrine. But uh, we do allow the kids to say the grace before they eat. And of course the seniors, you ain't gonna tell them they can't. <laughs> They're gonna have Bible study and we have minister come in on Fridays. And uh, our Bible study has is, is grown like uh, wildfire just more recently. So yeah, we do have some things that are doctrine, but we, uh, give this freedom to choose to be a part of that if they want to. Because you got bingo, what, what else do you have? Oh gosh. Our program, in, particularly in the senior program, is built around activities to help seniors stay healthy in mind, body, and spirit. And so we have a lot of health education. Uh, we have um, speakers that come in every week. And Tuesday is really our health education day and they come in and they can talk to them about a variety of subjects, uh, some particular health issues, sometimes it's talking about scams, uh, sometimes it's nutrition, uh, anything that will uh, help a senior physically uh, stay healthier, uh, that's what we try and do on, on Tuesdays. Um, uh, when we, Thursday is the bingo day and nothing supersedes that Thursday. You're not going to bring anything else in on Thursday because we usually have our largest group of seniors here on that day. And they do not like to to go to any kind of lecture or any kind of class if bingo is going on. So we might as well not even have that. Yeah, but uh, uh, we go on trips. We, we're looking forward to going to Shipshawana and St. Robert's picnic is coming up. We do a uh, boat ride uh, on the Grand Lady River boat ride every fall. Um, we've, we, we take them shopping. Uh, they can uh, a lot of times ask for particular, we went to the Black History Museum over in, in, near Ferris State University and on that campus. 
we 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 like to like to get them uh, give them opportunity to have something to look forward to. Um, we think that helps with uh, depression and things like that with seniors. If they know they've got a, a something fun coming up, we go to the Whitecaps game. We've been to the drives, uh, a basketball game. Uh, we've gone to some of the hockey games. We just like to let, let our, our seniors get out and about because many of them live in a, uh, uh, an apartment or some place where they don't get the opportunity to just get out in the world. And you know, if you're just looking at the four walls, after a while that can be kind of depressing. So we, we like to have some things here and like our prom, uh, we like to have an, the annual prom to give our seniors the opportunity to just have some fun. You know, that's that's a part of, of, of what we why we exist. Like your prom, what is what is that like? Every year for twenty years we've had a, a senior prom and it was came out of the idea that a lot of the seniors, uh, if they dropped out of school or they were poor at the uh, from a poor community or they didn't have the uh, opportunity to have a prom when they were young. And uh, one of the uh, directors of the, uh, the senior program years ago thought, well, let's just have a prom. And it was kind of a nice little party. They had it in the dining room. And so for several years they did the, that prom and, and it was a lot of fun and it grew. And so when I came on um, um, being the director of the program, the prom was already institutionalized here and the seniors look forward to it every year. And the the, my role was just to grow it and to make it even more spectacular. We moved it from the dining room to the gym where we could have more room. And then we decided, well, let's go, you know, we used to use the, the picnic table, uh, plastic uh, tablecloth and for a while. And then we said, we're going to take it up a step and we're going to use linen and crystal and, and, and china and take it up another notch. And then we had people in the community who volunteered to um, be our decorators. And um, we've added to, instead of just having boombox music, and we've got a DJ, and then we added photographs. And come, because you go to the prom, you always gotta stand there with your date and get your picture taken. We uh, did that. And then we added the photo booth, where it's more of just a fun thing to go in and put on a costume, a boa, and a hat or sunglasses or something and, and get your picture taken. We did that this year and last year. But um, it has grown to now we got 150 seniors uh, coming to the prom and it takes a large number of volunteers to be waiters and waitresses. Um, we have community uh, helpers like the Women's Life Group that uh, donated every year a little gift, a little memento. This year they um, did a CD of, of oldies uh, but goodies and the first song on there uh, is Some Kind of Wonderful, which was our theme for this year's uh, prom. Um, the, one of our staff people has a cousin who owns a florist shop and every year for the last five years she's given long stem roses to all the women that attend the prom for them to take with them when they go home. Um, we've just been really blessed to have folks that um, provide the things that make the prom a special night. And almost immediately after the prom is over, they're ready for, what are we gonna do next year? You know, what's the prom gonna be like next year? So it's a, it's a nice evening for seniors. And you have different organizations that volunteer? Yes, we, we um, have a, a partnership with some of the, uh, some of the nursing programs. Uh, Grand Rapids Community College in particular, uh, their nursing students, their instructor, Ms. Laura Moody, is a former participant here at the United Methodist Community House. And so we called upon her to um, work with us on the prom. And so at one time, her husband, who used to live in the house next door, when he was coming up, when he was a kid, he lived next door, Reverend uh, Nathaniel Moody. And he got involved by letting us use the limousines. So we used to pick all the seniors up in a limo to come to the prom. 
but because you can only get so many in uh, limo at, uh, at, one at one time, it was cumbersome getting everybody here. And so we opted to go back to using the buses where we can get everybody here in time enough to have them enjoy the, uh, the full effect of the prom from the beginning to, to the end. But Laura has a class as she's an instructor for the nurses and so she gives them opportunity to get credit uh, for helping out with the prom. So they come and volunteer and they volunteer to do the uh, help with the decorating and then they serve as waiters and waitresses and then dance partners uh, at the prom. So they s serve a lot of functions. So yeah, the, the, it's key for us. We had Blue Cross Blue Shield this year uh, and last year. They're very involved with washing dishes, serving food. Um, they also even brought the hors d'oeuvres, the fruit and relish trays that we had uh, this year were donated by them. So yeah, we've got a lot of good, good, good people in the community to help us out. And this is not a transient senior program. This is these seniors come all the time. Yes, am we. I, am I correct? You're correct. Uh, we have some seniors who've been involved in being a senior in this program longer than I've been the director here. Um, they, uh, it's kind of like a home away from home. Some of the seniors, uh, Miss Elma Robinson, I can't remember the senior program when she wasn't attending, and comes every day. We have this whole group of senior companions, and they receive a little stipend for just helping seniors who are less mobile, less able, and they, they, uh, if they don't do anything more than just sit and talk with them, be a companion to them, then they're doing their job. They're here to kind of just be that person that. Uh, a senior who uh, is de dealing with some difficulties or can't get their coffee or whatever, that's what senior companions do. So they are also, but a lot of those senior companions have been here long term, long time. Any final thoughts about the family or the, or the United Methodist House? Well, um, the U United Methodist Community House has been, like I said, I came here as a kid myself. Um, uh, when I was in high school, uh, I came here for program after school programs. And um, my kids, while I was uh, working here, uh, my younger kids have been able to come to the program. And in particular, you know, because I couldn't be at home, then after school, my son would come down here. So it's been a service to, to, to me. I've been very blessed. My kids all. Um, Receive. I'm one of those people that all my kids receive scholarships for college. I didn't have to spend any money for my kids to go, uh, go, go to school. And, and like I mentioned, my daughter has a PhD. She all the way to a PhD, and when she, she graduated, when she graduated, she did not own a dime. What's her name? Her, uh, Kelly, my daughter Kelly. She received a PhD in agricultural and biosystems engineering uh, from the University of Illinois. And she originally left, uh, she was valedictorian out of Ottawa High School. She went to um, North Carolina A&T State University on a scholarship. Then from then on it was fellowships and she never ended up, she, her, she received a, all the way to a doctorate and she never had to pay anything for her education. She just had to maintain good grades and uh, that's what, what, what she did. Um, my, I have a son also who played football through uh, at Indiana University and received his uh, degree um, and his degree is in business and um, uh, he played, he did get some injuries so I guess he paid a little something, he paid the price in flesh I guess but uh, there again I didn't have to do anything but make sure he had uh, a way home <laughs> for the holidays and uh, uh, occasionally send them a little pocket change because they don't, they don't allow them to make any money and you can't hardly work that much, but not much. And then my other son played basketball, so he was out in California in Contra Costa. Contra Costa, you ever heard of Contra Costa? Contra it's up near uh, San Francisco. Oakland, no, no. Uh, it's way up there near o yeah. o Oakland, Oakland, Oakland. Uh, up in that area. 
And but he was he's the middle child, and so he was at several schools. He kind of moved around. John Logan, and he was in uh, Black Hawk College in India, in Illinois, and uh, he even was at Community College for a semester. So he he kind of moved around a little bit, but he finally made it on through, and um, we're just proud that all of them. I never had to. You play, they could play ball, but I told my children, I expected them to go to college, but I told them what I could afford if they went to college. And that was, I could send them to community college, and then they could go to Grand Valley, but stay at home. And uh, that way they could go to college and receive a degree. If they wanted to be out of state or at a big college somewhere else, they had to do that on their own. And they figured out a way to do it. They figured out a way to do it. So. Uh, I'm just proud to, to do that. I have a husband who's been um, key in everything. He's the... What does your husband do? Well, my husband right now is retired, but he owned his... His name, his, his name is Ron Christopher. He owns his uh, own insurance agency, Christopher Insurance. And he worked for many years for Allstate Insurance, and then he finally decided to go out on his own and have his own insurance company. So he was in the insurance business for uh, 24 years and then he just retired two years ago and uh, we sold our house and moved to a condo so we don't even have to cut the grass anymore but um, uh, uh, I've been very blessed because a lot of the things working in a nonprofit you don't make much money and there have been uh, the Methodist has been through situations where they were scraping the bottom of the barrel just to get pay you anything so uh, but through it all, I was able to stay here, and I'm very grateful for that. And I did that because of having a husband who supported me no matter what. And so now we're we're just enjoying his retirement, and I'm looking toward um, not full retirement. Um, I would like to, in, uh, in 2016, to go to part-time. And uh, since my husband is retired, he wants to do a little more traveling, get away on the weekends and stuff. And so that will allow me to do that and still be here where I've been all my life. I've been here at the community house for 20 something years, 24 years. And um, that's not including the times I left and came back. And so um, I think that it's it would be difficult for me to just say, uh, to, next year I'm not gonna be here anymore. So I'm doing it a little bit at a time. So next year I'll be here part time. I'm looking to work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and uh, if that works out, um, maybe at the year after that I will retire for real, and 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 uh, just come and be a senior in the senior department, sitting in the dining room waiting on services. So I guess to kind of finish up, what's the the most important thing that you want people to know about who Miss Anita is? I think... Or was, or... Uh -huh, uh -huh. I, my, my, I think the... I, I oh, would like to people to know that I try to make Isn't a difference. Isn't that a, a bit you were just, No, no. Just yeah, yeah. Who but, you are. Who yeah, you are. I, I try to make a difference. Every day I try to be positive. I try to be a person that encourages people and um, a person that doesn't sweat the small stuff. I, I, I um, like to be uh, a person that's about doing what's best for somebody. If I can figure out a way to, to, to make somebody's day easier or make somebody's uh, uh, day, make them feel better about what's going on in their lives, I like to I like to be the person that's uh, doing that. Um, I know some people may think it's kind of a, a, a easy way out sometimes, but I just think life is a lot more enjoyable, and uh, and and we have so few days anyway. Life is short, so I would much rather uh, spend it doing something positive, something helpful to somebody, and uh, that's just who Anita is. I uh, appreciate it mm -hmm. very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah.